Welcome to the Blue Oasis Podcast. This is the podcast for finding peace and prosperity, learning the history of hobbies, as well as developing a little side hustle. If you want to find peace and prosperity in your life, this is your show. Get ready. You're listening to the Blue Oasis Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Rothstein. All right, let's get to the show. All right, and welcome back to the Blue Oasis Podcast. I am your host, Adam Rothstein. Uh, with me today is Mr. Tim Heal. Tim, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Adam, how are you? I'm terrific. Uh, so you are retired. You do not generate any income uh, from your hobbies, but um, you just told me that you uh, uh, generated some money from your uh, podcast for the first time. Yeah, I'm I'm with uh, Podmatch, and uh, I wasn't expecting anything at all. But uh, I just earned my first commission, two dollars fifty. Nice. I mean, that's that's going to help the retirement fund. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, my retirement fund is going to be helped out. I had ten dollars and eight cents, um, and uh, made for the first payment, and um, and it was uh pretty yeah it was a yeah it was a first step you know first steps it's nice to get yeah and and uh like and i've done this before with uh, like find away voices and everything of the sort um there's that um so um what are your hobbies what do you like to do in your free time well um i've I've had a lot of hobbies over the years. I mean, my way back, I, I started off, um, I used to play rugby when I was at school and I managed to more or less carry that all, all the way through up until I was 56. I played my last game of rugby when I was 56 for um, my regimental vets. And uh, I was playing scrum off. Um, and that's the guy that puts the ball in the, to the scrum and uh, doesn't know... I don't know quite what goes on in the scrum once I've let the ball go in, but um, once it comes out, it's mine again. <laughs> and I, and then I, I shift it around. So uh, I've played pretty much rugby most of my, um, most of my life. Um, I like to watch rugby and uh, today we've got England Island at Twickenham. So we're going to go, go around to some friend's house and watch the rugby, which will be good fun. Um I was into hang gliding many years ago and I, I became a hang gliding instructor for the army. Um, I worked at the army hang gliding, uh, hang, army hang gliding center for three years where it became the joint services hang gliding center. And uh, so I used to go out on a daily basis teaching soldiers and, uh, and airmen and uh, sailors to, to fly hang gliders. And uh, we did a few expeditions. I went to Scotland flying. I went down to Italy and we went to Spain on big expeditions where we gained lots and lots of flying experience for guys. Um, what else have I done? Recently, I've been into sailing. Um, I, I've, I've sailed on and off, uh, been messing about for, with boats for donkey's years. Um, but the last 15, 15 20 years, We've had our own boats, and I've had three boats. Um, I started off with a, a Ving Marine 23, which is a Swedish-built boat. Um, it's got a centre cockpit on it. Uh, it feels like a 27-foot boat, <laughs> um, but it's a motor sailor. And it was, it was great under sail, but you had to put the engine on to tack because <laughs> it didn't have enough power to be able to bring it round. So you just put a donkey on tack switch the donkey off and then away you go again then we we changed that in for a helberg grassy 30 uh helberg grassy 312 which was a lovely boat it was an half cockpit version of the the helberg grassy which is a, another swedish built boat and then we went to uh it was one of those horrible sailing days so we we didn't bother sailing so we went to uh to transworld here in england who are the Helberg Rassi agents? Um, just as sort of because they had a full lineup of boats on the hard, 
to for sale and, and um, we had a they they gave us a one of these master keys and said fill your boots go and go and have a look w- at what you want so we looked at the the 34 the 342 uh there was a a 36 there there was a, a 37 there was a a 44 uh and a 48 so we had to look at all these boats and, and my wife fell in love with the 36 Anyway, the, that's where the mistake happened because uh, the guy, the salesman there, a guy called the Reverend Willie Buse, talked us into buying a, a one down in Jersey. <laughs> so, so the next thing we do, we fly, we, we we took a plane, we flew down to Jersey to have a look at this thirty six, and it was gorgeous. Um, and we put in a, an offer for this boat. <laughs> And they accepted. Uh, so we ended up with having two boats. <laughs> yeah. But I, um, we managed to do a bit of a deal. They they, they took ours in, in part exchange and uh, we, we had this 36. And we sold out for quite a few years. When I actually retired in 2018, we took the boat and we sailed up to the Baltic. We sailed from, from Gosport in England al- along the south coast, eastwards, to um to dover we went across to to belgium and holland we went into germany and we went through the kiel canal and we went all the way up the kiel canal uh, into denmark and, and we had uh, uh, about two months sailing around denmark and sweden on the on the the western side of uh, sweden which was fabulous and then we sailed the boat back again oh. and then and then we came out of lockdown in 20, 2020, 21. Yeah. And uh, we came out of that lockdown and and we set off and we sailed down to the Sillies. Um, and we had a lovely couple of weeks in the Sillies and then we decided, well, we're really, we might as well go and tick off another bucket list and, and go around the UK. So we, we ended up on that trip sailing around the UK. That's... And, uh, <laughs> so, we had the ship's cat with us, um, and then on the way back down, we we left Inverness, and the plan was we we're going to sail one hit from Inverness all the way back to Gosport, which was about 630 miles. All was going great, and we were going into the third night, one of those pitch black nights you can't see, if, you can't see your hand in front of your face. The wind had died off a little bit, so we needed to put, I mean, it had been pretty horrible weather anyway it was overcast and raining a bit so we put the engine on uh, just to charge the batteries up for, for the overnight um, going down and we were about seven or eight miles off of Scarborough and this is this is the third night we're going in and all of a sudden we picked up a line of lobster pots and bomb there was a big bang and oh Christ what we hit and we're real fast so I just called up the Coast Guard just to let them know we were there because we, we we were just inside the, the shipping lane. Um, anyway, they said they'll send out a lifeboat. So they sent a the lifeboat out um, and the, managed to free us, but we were still still had a bit of line attached. So we had to come into the, the South Bay at Scarborough and they sent out the inshore boat with a diver on who went down and, and, and cut us free. But they picked up that we've got the ship's cat on board who had his own life jacket on at the time because we all had life jackets on because that's the way you do it, especially at night. So so they've picked up on this story. And the next thing we know that they, they're ringing us up for, for a bit more of the story about the ship's cat being on board and, and wearing his life jacket. And, uh, and we're now in this year's edition of the Royal National Lifeboat Institute book, yearbook, and Artie, the ship's cat, has got a 14-page spread <laughs> on his story about being rescued. <laughs> uh, I have to, I have to ask of the, um, of just motorboats, um, or rather sailboats. Uh, I'm not too big into it. Um, mm-hmm. when you're first starting out, you don't, well, yeah, you always bring a partner or someone with you to get going and eventually you learn the ropes um is well i've done i've done this before um uh, i went to camp uh sleepaway camp in north 
Carolina, and I just could not figure it out for the life of me. Um, uh, how did you um, learn about all the engines um, and just how, and, and just more of the maintenance of the uh, ships? Well, the uh, this is where the British Army have, have been really, really kind to me. They they sent me on lots and lots of of, of courses, and we have what we call the Joint Service uh, Adventure Sail, the Joint Service Adventure Sail Training Centre down here in Gosport, and we also had the British Army uh, Kill Kill Yacht Club in Kiel in Germany and I've had opportunities to go to both of these places and do sailing courses so they teach you how to sail they teach you all about the maintenance of the boats and stuff like that so you get all that training for free um well it's not free because the queen pays for it and you get paid to do it so that was a proper billy bonus so um that's how I, I got into sailing that's... basically it's it's nice it's nice um and um and you've have you ever uh, sailed on the atlantic um ocean on this side of the east coast of the united states i've not i've been on the west side of the atlantic um when we when we left the silly isles we sailed uh, across the that open bit of atlantic ocean between the silly isles and Ireland, and um, it got a little bit rough, to say the least. I mean, there was five, six-metre waves. One minute you could see for miles, the next minute you just got a wall of water around the boat, thinking, well, I hope it's going to carry on floating. <laughs> yeah, it was a pretty, pretty tough time. Um, the weather forecast didn't get it right that day. <laughs> Well, we managed to get through. I mean, we survived and we're here today to tell the tale. Nice. Um, so, but, um, oh, yeah. So uh, you are into motorcycling. Um, I know oh, yes. one per- uh, I know one person in my network who is uh, into motorcycling. Uh, tell me about that. Um, uh, uh, what's exactly the difference between driving a car and a motorcycle? Is there just more freedom that comes with it or just that sense of just being able to move a little more easier between lanes um i guess the the, the main difference between a motorcycle and a car is that a mo- motorcycle has two wheels and it tends to be a little bit quicker so you, you can squeeze through the traffic and stuff like that you really need to have your wits about you to ride a motorbike um there are so many more hazards for a motorcyclist than a car. I mean, if, if, you, if you've never ridden a motorbike, then I think it should be compulsory to ride a motorbike before you're allowed to drive a car, just to give you that much a better understanding of the dangers that are out there. I mean, you're kind of cocooned in a car and you don't realise how dangerous roads can be. Um, but it's like riding, a, a, say, a push bike. If you ride a push bike and you ride down the roads, you you understand the dangers. And car drivers don't kind of get it. I mean, they'll come within s- sort of six inches of you, um, and, which could be quite dangerous if if they're going quick and you get a gust or you, you just slightly off, bang, you end up in the uh, as a donor in the hospital. And it's pretty much the same with motorbikes. Um, I've been riding motorbikes since I was 10. Um, I had a uh, first motorbike, which was a, a BSA A10 Gold Flash 650 with a sidecar on it that we used to ride around the farm. Uh, I, I worked on a farm when I was 10 uh, and we were allowed to play, uh, ride these motorbikes. And then the next motorbike I had was a, a Royal Enfield 350 Bullet from 1959. Uh, so it's a it's a year younger than me. <laughs> oh. You can't, um, in um, Maryland, where I'm from, uh, you can't, 
like there are some uh, states in the United States where you can't even drive until you're 18 and you were riding a motorcycle at 10. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I, we, we, we all did it. Um, and it was on private land. It wasn't on, on the road. Oh, uh, it wasn't. Well, uh, I, I was when I was. <laughs> so I had this A10 gold flash and I had a, a 350 bullet. Um, the 350 bullet, I did go out on the road occasionally on it um, when I was sort of 15. But when I was actually 16 and legally allowed to ride a motorcycle on the road, um, you, you, you were only allowed to ride a 50cc. So I ended up with a, a bike called a rally runabout. So it was a, you pedaled it as well as it's got a little engine on. Um, and we, we had some fun with that, actually. Some, some Bryce Bart suggested that, why don't I put a bit of this rocket fuel in it? So we've got some really high octane rocket fuel. Where are we going from? I'm not quite sure. But we stuck it in this thing and, and it took off like a scolded cat. And all of a sudden there was a big bang and, and a pistol came out through the head. <laughs> Destroyed it. Um, I, I um, actually don't. Top tip, don't don't use rocket fuel in a, in a small capacity motorcycle. It doesn't work. Understood. I actually don't know um, the difference. Like I've seen like these you know, thinner wheels on motorcycles. And then there's a little wider, like, yeah. and then there's like the one in uh, Batman. Um, I think it was uh, 2008, if I'm not mistaken, that one with like these huge giant wheels and uh, Batman was uh, facing uh, Bane or like, and Hathaway was Catwoman in mm-hmm. that, I think. Um, uh, yeah. So is there a, a difference you get when uh, riding on a, motorcycle with a, a wider wheel versus a thinner wheel yeah the, the, the tires on motorcycles i mean the motorcycles come in all different sort of shapes sizes and uses so it, it, these bikes that have got the big wide tires and, and stuff like that they tend to be cruisers they tend to be like harleys and um, um ducati Devald, which which have the big wide wheels and they, and they're, they're cruising bikes. Then you've got your racing bikes, um, and your racing bikes have, if they're on the track, they're, they're using what they call slicks. So there's there's no tread on the tire at all, but they're a really soft compound that um, when it gets warm, it's really sticky, and that's why when when you see a motorbike almost on its side when it's going around corners. It's because the tires that they're using are really sticky tires, and they don't slide so much. If you if you try to do that when it's when you've got cold tires, you're going to come unstuck, guaranteed every time. You have to warm your tires up on the track before they they become sticky. That's why you see with a same with the cars on the track, they they have tire warmers on that that heat the tires up, um, but you still need to go out and warm them up before you. Uh, before you set off on them. And then you get your, your road tyres, and your road tyres are constructed slightly different. Depends on what type of motorbike you're on. You've got your sports bikes, you've got your touring bikes, and the tyres are, are are all made differently for, for different purposes. And you have different tread patterns that dissipate water and stuff like that. So you've got tyres for, for wet weather, and you've got tyres for for normal conditions um so tires are a big big part of motorbikes and it's a it's a it can get quite technical uh and and that's still beyond my scope um i i will just <laughs> like i don't know if i'll ever get on a motorcycle i mean i certainly like the idea of it being cheaper and more fuel efficient but i just don't know if i'll ever get on a motorcycle um ever i would rather i would rather drive a sedan and just yeah and and still um if i'm doing a road trip i mean of course i'll take the sedan and go up yeah. and and i'm in florida now i would i would just drive to like new jersey um to see my cousin don't go to new jersey oh new what <laughs> don't go to new jersey oh uh, oh is <laughs> that know, is that you know heard that saying uh, uh, don't go to New Jersey. Um, yeah, don't go to New Jersey. I, like, 
vaguely um i mean <laughs> uh, i mean like i like, like but no 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 um mm-hmm. where my cousin lives he he it is actually a nice and peaceful little town in there and he's not too far from new york city he is um an avid uh sports fan uh roots of the yankees yeah. um the, not really the Knicks, but he roots for the New York Rangers as well, the NHL team. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, as well, you are into skiing as yes. well. Um, I never skied in my life. I've skated on the ice. I've um, played hockey for most of my life. Uh, is there, have you, you know, have you uh, also skated as well? I've done a little bit of skating. Um, I tried it out. It's it's not my favourite way of getting around on on ice. I must admit, but I I, I have done it, and I, I I'm I was okay at it. And I mean, you fall over a few times, uh, <laughs> get a wet bum generally. But um, for skiing, um, I first went skiing when I was um, sixteen, and we had three weeks down in Bavaria with the British Army. I I say I joined the Army when I was 16 and they took us to Germany uh, for, for, they called it Exercise Snow Queen. So I had three weeks there and I really got the hang of skiing. And then when, uh, then I I joined my my battalion and we went to Norway and I did three months in Norway on what we call Pusser's Planks. Um, and, you know, I mean, they they take the fun out of skiing a little bit, but that's free hill skiing. So so it's like cross country skiing, but you have got a pack on your back or you you're dragging a pork. And, and from there on, I, I've I've always skied free hill, and I suppose I skied the last thirty five thirty five nearly forty years telemark skiing. And I always used to have leather boots uh, and sort of touring type planks until I went over to plastic boots when they brought in the plastic boots and um, wasted skis, a bit like Alpine skis. So they're, they're, they're shaped, they've got a fat front, fat back and wasted in the middle. You'd be able to turn them a lot easier. And, and, and plastic boots kind of transform telemark skiing a lot. And um, and I used to take part in competitions. Um, there's a what we call the British Telemark Championships held every year. They used to be held down in Austria, um, and they've moved to France. and And I ski for the British Army, and I used to take guys, teams of guys down there to to ski. And um, yeah, I ski Telemark, which is a wonderful way of getting around. I, I can't understand um, why people want to go alpine skiing when when they can telemark and be a lot more comfortable. I mean, alpine boots, I mean, you clamp them down and, and your feet are solid in them and you can't move. But with a telemark boot, you, you can walk around in them, the, the toe flexes. And uh, all right, so it's a little bit harder on your thighs, but it's it's just a different technique. So anybody out there that says, well, te- uh, telemark's really hard, it's just a different technique. You get the hang of it. You, your thighs get the hang of it, and uh, and to ski telemark competition is great fun. Nice, nice. Um, you have your own podcast. Um, I do. What's the name of it? It's the Tim Hill Podcast: Ordinary People's Extraordinary Stories. So it, it's it started off. It, I actually started off on ancestry uh, and I was looking at my my family's history and I got to my great grandfather who on my dad's side who was in the Royal Navy as a chief stoker and he lived here in Portsmouth I, I lived just across the harbour in, in Gosport so on the south coast of England and he was in uh, the First World War and he died in 1930 and I'd love to have had a chat with him about his life and, and how he got on and stuff like that. Um, but I'm not a time traveller just yet, so that's not possible. And I got to thinking, well, his story's lost. His life story is gone. 
it, it, unless we can get to time travel and go back in time, it's not going to happen. What if it happens to me? I thought, well, why don't I tell my story for my children, my grandchildren and generations to come? And that's how it came about. Um, so I started doing a my life story. I did 24 half an hour episodes of my life. So if you're ever suffering from insomnia and you need to try and get to sleep, stick one of them on, put you to sleep, no problem at all. So I got, I got to the end of that 24 episodes and I thought, what do I do next? Well, I did another couple of episodes and went a little bit more in depth into some of the, the trips that I've done. And then I thought, well, what about telling other people, giving them the opportunity to leave a legacy for, for their relatives for the future generations? So I started with my mum. She's the only one I got left. So my mum told her story and we had a really good chat about that. And then I started doing other people. And it's kind of snowballed from there. Um, and then I got into Podmatch. And Podmatch has, I mean, it's, it's inundated me with people wanting to come on to my show and tell their stories. And, um, yeah, I, I, I'm up to, I don't know, 55 other people at the moment. Um, and I'm having an absolute ball with it. I mean, it's, it is really good listening to other people's stories. And the way I do it, I've got two ears, one mouth, and that's the the the, the, um, the proportion that I use them. So I let other people talk and, and tell their stories, and then I try and eke out a bit more information from them. And um, I think I'm kind of getting a little bit better at it than I started off, so... But I have I have spoken to some fascinating people. So if there's anybody out there that, that wants to have a listen, go in for the the Tim Hill podcast. All the people's extraordinary stories, and there is a plethora of people out there with some really fascinating lives. Indeed, um, I have definitely uh, been uh, on Podmatch for a while now, and. And I can honestly tell you that it has been a blessing. Um, I, I've told people about this in my network. It certainly has helped them. And they're like, Adam, thank you for, for the tip. And uh, I'm glad. I'm actually a bit concerned. I might have to turn a few people down. I'm just getting inundated with so many people. And it's like, oh, yeah, we I'm matched. Up, I'm up to, match. to, to the end of May. <laughs> I, like, I, I, I put one out a week and I'm up to the end of May at the moment and I've, I've got another 11 in the bag yet. <laughs> I do not, like, there is, a, like, another one, like, I've got another one tomorrow I've got to do, but um, but these actually come out weekly, so you'll you'll be there yeah. on Wednesday. Um, and if you're listening to this, it should be... Um, Wednesday, not the 15th. It's the Wednesday, the 16th, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not looking yeah. at my calendar, um, but <laughs> but I, I can pull that up real quickly. Yeah, um, yeah, Wednesday, the 16th is it'll be there on all um, major uh, podcast platforms. Um, yeah. Um, you, yeah. Oh, 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 go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just waiting for the next question. I'm, I'm, oh, 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 oh I'm like thought, I thought you had something here. else, something else to say. So, um, with retirement, um, uh, you had, I don't know the the difference uh, between like you have a Roth IRA, um, or or is there something different in England? Because I actually don't, I uh, don't understand um, how how that would work. Is it the same there or is something well, different? No, what we get is um, because I served in the, in the British army and I qualified for a pension uh, with them. That's, that's, that's my kind of, that's my main pension. That's where the bulk of my, my income comes from. Um, I also had uh, uh, two other private pensions that I, I, I'm drawing on, but my state pension I don't get until I'm 66. So I've got another couple of years to go before I actually get a state pension. And the kind people at the uh, Her Majesty's 
Revenue Tax and Revenue Office have told me that I'm going to have a reduced pension because I retired early at 60. So instead of getting the full pension uh, that I should have been entitled to, they're going to give me a slightly reduced one because I'm, I've, I've stopped paying in national insurance towards that pension, which I'm a little bit miffed about. Um, my wife was also uh, was in the same. She, she was one of the WASPy women. So the government, in their infinite wisdom, decides that they're going to change the system. Women always used to, to be able to retire at 60 and get the state pension at 60, and then they've moved the goalpost, and now they get it at the same time as men at 66. So my wife's got another another three years or so to wait for her state pension, but she already gets a, a, a pension from her works when she because we're both retired now. I don't so think there you that, go. Oh, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with retiring early. I mean, I mean, uh, like people like are like dr- like dreading just um working oh i have to work another three years in this office um yeah and 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 work for a, a boss that i don't hate and that's why i've been encouraging side hustles and uh and adding more to mm. savings and 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 about a week ago i earned 30 dollars from one client uh for two projects and and so so the money's out there um is as well just laying that out there um well well all i would say is that um plan for your retirement if you want to retire early then you really need to look at um uh, uh, putting in some sort of nest egg together whether it's paying into a, a private pension plan that's going to mature when when you want to retire whether it's investing in property that you can you can rent out and then sell when you're ready to retire and put that into your pension pot. Um, but plan for your retirement. Don't don't sit back and think it, I can't be bothered, because when it comes to retiring uh, and you've got to work until you, I mean they're talking about putting the pension age up again here. Um, I think it's gone up to sixty seven for some people. For me, I think I'm still I just fall into that 66 bracket where I'll get my pension in. But it, it ain't enough to live on. Um, and they've just taken away what they call a triple lock, which was ring fencing pension pot money in the government. So they've unlocked that. And so the government's now using the pension money to, to fund all other things that... Uh, so we might not even get a, a proper pension when it happens. So, yeah, it's uh, it's taking the fun out of the game a little bit, but plan for your pension. That's all I would say. Here in the United States, we were talking about moving it to age 71. So um, our social security is going to be um, a little different. Mm-hmm. Um, but but it's like, like I, but if I can plan, this out in in advance and and even get a cash flow going um yeah. i would be more secure and that's what everyone else should be doing in the future because you don't know what tomorrow brings there is going to be a rain uh, like yeah. it rains it pours um and you have to have that emergency fund and and if you can keep that cash flow going yeah. especially with like a subscription service uh you're going to be protected more than most yeah um it's, yeah i mean physically i mean underneath this gorgeous exterior there's an absolute train wreck going on i mean 44 years under the colors in the british army as an infantry soldier has taken it a toll on on, on this old carcass of mine and when i retired at 60 i don't think i could have carried on going to work i i'm even now i struggle at getting around um, and I'm a statistic. I'm on a waiting list. Um, I don't know. COVID has caused this massive backlog of, of people waiting to be seen by specialists. And I'm one of those. I'm, I'm, I, the other day, I had the x-rays done on my, my pelvic region because I'm having real problems with my hips at the moment. And it's, it's a common problem with British soldiers. 
Um, but I've got um, the 20th of April is uh, I've got a, an appointment with a specialist to have a look at it. So whether that's going to, whether he's going to move the goalposts on me again, I don't know. But if if he does give us the green light, then then I'm on another list waiting for for the operation to to renew one of my hips. Depends on that. I don't know how they look at it. Whether they wait until you can barely move before they do anything about it, or whether they do a little bit of uh, prevent it and and give you a bit more of a a chance at it. So we will wait and see what happens on that. I. Uh, I do want to just bring in a different, like just slightly diverge from this. Um, yeah. I was injured. Like I suffered a lot of injuries from hockey and like, and being checked into the boards a lot. I mean, that that, that, that takes a toll on you too. And uh, college <laughs> and then like junior year of college, it's like, okay, you're going and you're going to be my assistant coach. Uh, so I was an assistant coach uh, for the Towson Tigers for a little while. And and if only I was playing baseball instead of hockey, um, like yeah. I actually could hit the ball. Um, I don't think I'd, <laughs> I don't think I would have gone on to be what I am in terms of uh, a hockey player. And and I had two newspaper articles before I could drive. And then I wound up in USA hockey. So, um, mm. so that is one thing as well. Um, I would say to anyone out there, do not, um, if, if it's taking a toll on you and you're getting injured, I, I just recommend back off. You do not want yeah. the back injuries. You do not want any issues going on with your spine. And I've been in several car accidents too. So that is not, um, yeah. Yeah. It, that, that does tend to slow you down a bit. I must admit, um, I've been fairly lucky with with with, with injuries. I mean, I, I injured my back uh, back in nineteen seventy eight, uh, and it plagued me ever ever since. And I, I've had odd, odd sessions in hospital where I, I spent six months in hospital with it. I, just before I left the, the army, I spent a month in hospital with my back. Um, it, it just it, I've got weak discs, but uh, through exercising that. I've always managed to sort of keep keep fairly stable, and it goes it goes, but you live with it. Uh, but it's, there's always a bit of pain there, but it hasn't stopped me doing stuff. I mean, I, I guess I've got a fairly strong pain threshold. Um, that it's one of those things that the army teaches you to to push through the the, the pain barrier and, and and just get on with it. Um, so I've spent a lot of years just getting on with it and you know, go, go and play rugby on a Saturday <laughs> and spend all the Sunday sort of trying to get over it uh, and into the following week. <laughs> and as time went on, it just takes longer to get over uh, over a game. Um, well, I remember sort of 20 years ago, uh, the regiment put out that they were, that they were going to have a, a vets game against one of the local teams in our recruiting area and uh, I thought that sounds like a bit of fun I'll go along I'll uh, I'll take my boots <laughs> I'll go in the last 10 minutes score a cheeky scrum half try and uh, come off a hero like anyway <laughs> it turns up with my boots they made me start the game and I played about 70 minutes <laughs> my my back actually was feeling really good um the past couple of days and I was like doing these exercises and, and it's, and it seems like the, it, like this, like my spine just needs to expand. Like I just need to like, like hold the pull-up bar and just like hang for like two minutes. Like, like yeah. that, that seems to be, uh, that certainly seems to help uh, as well. You have to look after the old carcass. Um, I, I have I have a massage once a week. Um, I'm, I'm 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 riddled with knots at the moment. And I've got a, a great um, physiotherapist that's knocking lumps out of me at the moment. And um, where where joints and everything start to seize up, and, and the muscle around them sort of seizing and 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 not stretching off enough, she's managing to get a lot more movement into my my carcass I'm I'm able to get out and do a little bit more at the moment so it's all thanks to her but um but it's actually 
it's 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 transforming. Where I've, where I've not been able to do a huge amount over the last couple of years because it's pandemic malarkey. Um, we're now coming out at the end of it. I'm able to to get on and do some bits more. So keep us fingers crossed. We'll um we'll get there and hopefully I'll be able to go back and do a bit more skiing at some stage <laughs> and get out on my motorbike as well. A hundred percent. Um. And- Anything else um, you want to discuss at all? No, I think we've, uh, I think we're there. I think we've had had a good chat. I mean, as for my motorbike, um, I'm, I'm down to one motorbike now. I did have, I did have eight in the garage at one stage, <laughs> but I'm down to one, and that's a uh, uh, a Ducati Multistrada, twelve hundred Multistrada. It's a touring bike. I did a, a great trip a couple of years back when a bait before lockdown. Um, we we went um, round France, across into Italy. We went to the Ducati factory. We came up to uh, the Gross Glockner, which is one of these iconic roads. Uh, we, we drove all the way up. We got to the Payage bit where we have to pay to go actually on the Gross Glockner itself. And it started snowing on the top. So we had to come all the way back down again, going to the next valley. Uh, and get a train through the the mountain into Austria. Um, we went to to Munich, had a few days in Munich, went to the Hofbrau House, um, and then we went off to Kolditz Castle. And for anybody that doesn't know what Kolditz Castle is, during the Second World War, it was where they kept all the the uh, prolific escapers. Um, so. Uh, we had a couple of nights staying actually in the castle itself. It's it's now um, a youth hostel, um, and they, they they do a great tour of the castle. They show you all of the escape routes that they found. There's a mock up of the glider that they built in there. Um, it's it's really really worth the trip into uh, to Kolditz. So, uh, and then we came back across Germany and. Uh, and home again. So I did 3,300 miles in three weeks. 3,300 miles in three weeks. Yeah, oh, it's a great, great trip. That's like, I could not even think of it doing that. Like I, I've been out of the country only once. I've seen Canada. I was in Buffalo uh, for a hockey tournament, like saw Niagara Falls. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like, like going to a foreign country is not, is like, is something that I haven't done that I wish I could have done before I went to college too. It was, it is a uh, definite, if you can do it, if you can finance it, uh, I say go for it. Um, and, just, and, and just plan ahead to, and, and don't, and, and don't, it doesn't have to be the most expensive thing. Just be financially ready. Uh, don't. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. So, I mean, travel just broadens the mind. I mean, I love traveling. Uh, and traveling by train too is definitely yeah. great. I've, I do not, I've never been on a bullet train at all. Um, and, mm. and this, and, uh, and bullet trains, you've been on them or you have them in the UK? No, we don't. But the, the, I guess the closest thing we've got to it is the, um, the Eurostar. Uh, and that that takes, I think, it's about an hour and hour and twenty minutes from from London to Paris, um, and that that does a sort of hundred and thirty odd miles an hour, something like that. Um, but one of my podcasts, um, the series two, it was a trip to Colditz. I did twice. I did a lot, a lot of years ago with a mate of mine, and we 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 did that by train, uh, and we ended up at, at Auschwitz as well on that trip. And then I, I joined that in with the, the motorbike trip I did with another mate to, to cold. It's uh, just recently. So that's, that's one of my podcasts. That's, the, that's quite a good one. I think. Oh, so we did yeah. cold. It's an Auschwitz uh, by train across Europe. And, um, and then I did the motorbike trip as well, but we didn't get to Auschwitz this time. If you've never been to Auschwitz, it's, um, it's a pretty gruesome place. It's it, it's a proper um, life leveller of, of seeing some of the real horrors 
of of what war can be about. And I think, yeah, and uh, yeah, and war is um, a racket, hundred percent. And we've got um, one going on at the moment. Yeah. Um, and, it, and the other part about this war in in Ukraine at the moment, that's diverted all the attention away from what's going on in Afghanistan at the moment. There's there's somewhere around about twenty five million Afghans starving. And, and suffering some real hardships in that. It's a pretty harsh winter now at the moment. And uh, people, are, kids are dying every day, and it's it's not being reported. The Taliban are, uh, are not letting journalists into the country. They're not letting people out of the country. It's a, a real sorry state of affairs in in in, um, in Afghanistan at the moment. I've got friends there that um, I communicate with occasionally, uh, and it's, it's pretty bloody grim. Um, and we are also, uh, the United States at least, is still, you know, connected with Saudi Arabia. There's a genocide going on in Yemen. It's, um, yeah. and and uh, I don't know if you're f- uh, too familiar with uh, Dave Smith, but he's a, a comedian here in the States, um, and close with my mentors, uh, mentor as well um and he was the only one talking about it i do not notice this in the um corporate media i have to go to him yeah. to learn about it um or i have to yeah i have to dig you have to dig deep for some of this, this stuff as well you do. um and uh, but if but uh to anyone listening uh if you get these different perspectives if you can dig deep and um do your own research um I guarantee you, to you, you're going to be better off than 90% of the people um, that just um, overhear this and they're like, oh, that's, that's bad. Like, like, no, no, you need to like dive deep because yeah. it, it is better to have this knowledge. And that is actually what leads that helps us move towards peace and prosperity. Yeah, I mean, it's the, the mainstream media are the worst enemies of the public. They 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 focus in on one subject. I mean, for instance, at the moment, everything is about Ukraine. Well, it is over here anyway. So COVID's gone away. The last two years has, has been forgotten. The the crisis we had in uh, in Afghanistan last year. Not even that doesn't even make the back pages, let alone anywhere in in that Yemen. Nothing's going on there. Down in uh, Sudan, I mean, there's an awful lot of atrocities going on down there at the moment. Mali, there's there's, there's a I mean, an awful genocide going on in that place. Uh, there's a UN mission down there trying to sort it all out. This is all happening. And the next thing you're going to see is China going to go into Taiwan because Putin's half got away with it at the moment. So that'll be the next thing that'll be the, the, the mainstream media will focus on. So all this other stuff's going on, but it's just not being reported on. Yeah, and and I do want uh, I, I I do really want to end this on a positive note. I I just do not want to end. Like I do not like ending on uh, negative notes. On a downer, sorry. Oh, right. Let's let's uh, some right. good news. There's lots yeah. of good. But, I'll but, tell you this. The, the good news is that on the eighth of April, Fantastic Beasts, the Secrets of Dumbledore, he's hitting the the cinemas. Uh, there I, you go. The latest in the Harry Potter series, Fantastic Beasts and the Secrets of Dumbledore, is in. The theatres from the eighth of April. There's a there's a big plus. Okay. Can't wait. Okay. Oh, can't um, wait. Okay. And and I will say that, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that you can uh, be be the one to make a difference. You can um, you can do the things that are going to put you ahead, and you can help that person with their side hustle. You can do, um, and you can move into a position helping them get there and find that passion too. I mean, I mean, the reason why we develop friendships typically is because we have that passion. 
I made so many uh, te- friends with through hockey. I've met um, people of all different backgrounds because it's more of an international game than baseball. Um, but but you put yourself out there, like you're going to find people that you that you mesh with, that you um you know bond with, and and you're going to learn more about yourself and them and. And don't be afraid to try new things. Uh, I think that all. I think that's going to be a good note to leave it on. What do you think? Absolutely. See, um, you've got one life. Live it, and live every day as though it's your last. And don't be put off by anything. Give it a go. If you give, give it your best shot. You won't go far wrong. Of course. All right, um, that will do it for the blue oh, this episode of the Blue Oasis podcast. Be sure to uh, like, um, comment if you're on YouTube, uh, follow this podcast, rate it five stars on iTunes, and uh, share it with a friend. And until the next episode, stay safe, stay great. I'll talk to you all then.